The Salt Wars! I can literally feel your eyes rolling into the back of your head. The Salt Wars. Could there possibly be a more somber or wearisome subject? Well, you're wrong. (laughs) I hate to be blunt, but you just are. You're wrong. In fact, I would go as far as to say that salt, yes, salt, has had a greater influence over history or our species than more or less any commodity in human history. More than gold, more than silver, and yes, more than oil. Cities have been named after it. Economies have been built on it. Armies have been financed by it. And yes, wars have been fought over it. Empires such as the Roman have risen because of it. Empires such as the British have fallen because of it. And whilst many people espouse the truism that most wars are fought over religion, I'm sorry to say that is bollocks, because most wars throughout human history have actually been fought over or surround the commodity of salt. Why die over salt in the first place? Your life depends on it, so you don't really have much of a choice. Your body doesn't produce sodium, aka salt, on its own, and you'll die if you don't have it. Given this, throughout antiquity and even into the modern era, salt has been something worth picking up a spear, sword, or even a gun for. In fact, if you live in much of the Northern Hemisphere, prior to refrigeration, you'd almost certainly not have survived a winter without a very large supply of salt. Given that salt was the only real means of preserving perishable food such as meat and fish. If you don't get enough salt, your body will become incapable of transmitting nerve signals, won't be able to fight infection, will be unable to process nutrients, and ultimately won't be able to pump blood around your body. Hyponeutremia, as it's also known, is a condition characterized by low levels of sodium in the blood. Its symptoms are quite similar to those caused by dehydration. In fact, in severe cases, the brain swells, which can lead to headaches, seizures, coma, and good old-fashioned death. It's not a pleasant way to die either. Now that we have clearly anchored salt somewhere in the back of your subconscious, I think it's easier to grasp why people have been willing to fight and die over the stuff for as long as they have. In fact, Interestingly, for large swathes of human history, salt was so important that people were actually paid in the stuff, or at the very least, paid an allowance specifically for the stuff. Roman soldiers may very well have belonged to this category. A monthly salt salary known as a salarium, which interestingly is thought to be where the word salary actually comes from, might have represented a portion of a Roman soldier's pay, even though some historians do dispute this. True or not, it cannot be undersold quite how important salt supply would have been to a budding civilization, especially one that was growing as rapidly as the Romans was. Roads were literally set up specifically to Rome from the Adriatic Sea merely to maintain a reliable supply. It was that important. Interestingly, salt could have even been considered a metric used to determine class and status. For example, if you've ever heard the expression below the salt, this was rooted in medieval seating arrangements at banquets, where people of, well, high regard were seated on tables with additional salt so that they could casually add it to their food at leisure. Whereas other people, who were below the salt, had to contend only with what had been added by the chef. Meaning that today, if someone says that you're below the salt, they're making a jab at your status. Wars were fought over salt in the past for basically the same reason that experts think wars will be fought over water in the future. Because we die if we run out of it. Meaning controlling salt, or water, can be a remarkably useful tool when building an empire. Or crushing one. The Punic Wars, 264 to 146 BCE. It's impossible to study Roman history and not have your imagination swept up by the series of wars Rome fought in the 2nd and 3rd century BCE. These conflicts, even by modern standards, were enormous in scale. They are probably lesser known than the campaigns of Caesar or the civil wars of Augustus, but over a million men participated in these wars. 
a simply unbelievable number considering the Punic Wars were being fought during the late Hellenistic period. For example, another war wouldn't involve these kinds of numbers on the European continent for 1,700 years. We are seeing the consequences of these wars even today. Trust me, the language that I am speaking would not be based in Latin if these wars had swung against Rome. And one of the large reasons they didn't, make no mistake about it, was because of salt. The Punic Wars were fought between the Roman Republic and the other contemporary regional power of the period, Carthage. Carthage was the North African trade and seafaring powerhouse based out of the city of Carthage in modern-day Tunisia. Now, the Punic Wars were stretched across three separate wars, with the second being by far the most interesting. With the first starting in 264 BCE on the island of Sicily, and ending with the Third Punic War in 149 to 146 BCE, culminating in the fall of the city of Carthage to Scipio Armilianus, a victory that was topped off by an alleged salting of the ground by Scipio so that he could spitefully insist on nothing ever growing again throughout the land of Carthage. Now, we don't know whether or not he actually did this, but it's a remarkably famous story about the fall of Carthage that, given the context of this video, would be unusual for me not to point out. Something that needs to be appreciated when studying the Punic Wars, but Roman history more broadly, is the fact that Rome wasn't powerful because it was amazing at war. In fact, there's fairly convincing argument to be made that in many situations they were crap at it. They were powerful because they were rich, stupendously rich. Now, a large reason as to why they were is because Rome monopolized a large portion of salt production throughout continental Europe. Salt is a taxable product, which meant that Rome was in a fairly unique situation to raise money for war as and when it needed to. Now, what also needs to be understood about the three Punic Wars is that although Rome won each war, they did not go well for Rome. Christ, the second one, they got their asses handed to them. I'll give you an example. During the first Punic War, Carthage was a famous naval power. Carthage absolutely exuded strength at sea, whereas Rome during the First Punic War didn't even have a navy. Every single war they participated in up until that point had happened on bone-dry land. However, Rome was rich enough to just build one from scratch. They just found some triremes that had washed up on the Italian coastline and just copied them. And then ended up defeating Carthage at sea, something that wouldn't have been able to happen if Rome hadn't been as enormously and stupendously rich as it was, a situation that they found themselves in largely by monopolising the production of salt. There are similar examples that I could evoke from the Second Punic War, which by comparison in terms of size was absolutely biblical. I won't bore you with the details, although they are not by any metric boring, at the Battle of Cannae alone, Rome allegedly lost anywhere between 55,000 and 70,000 troops in a day. These are First World War numbers. You cannot replace these kinds of numbers and then go on to win a war unless you are unimaginably rich. Rome was unimaginably rich because of salt. Thank you for watching that video. Now, my name is Luke and I'm one of the writers here at Salt Shack. Now, what we do here is we teach people geology, mineralogy, gemology, archaeology, paleontology, and all manner of ologies as it pertains to very interesting things that come out of the ground. We'll teach you how something forms or how it gets its colour. We'll tell you how to identify it. We'll tell you diagnostic techniques. We'll tell you all about fakes and we'll tell you the history and maybe mythology and how indelibly etched many of the things that we sell are into ancient folklore and the stories of very interesting civilizations. Now, if you want to better understand these things in order to have a more well-rounded understanding of very cryptic subjects or to better insulate yourself from many of the duplicitous practices that go on within the crystal industry, then why not follow us and join the club?